Adata's new PCIe Gen 4 drive, the S50 Lite, has me confused out of my mind. It's a one or two terabyte drive, has a Silicon Motion Gen 4 controller, as well as DR4 and SLC caching, and costs about the same slightly more than a Sabre Rocket Gen 4, except this one barely outperforms a PCIe Gen 3 drive in terms of its performance. Yeah, I'm, I'm stumped too, so let's take a look at it and see if we can work out if it's any good and why it exists. Of course, first, if you haven't already, consider subscribing for more videos like this one every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Starting with the spec, this is a TLC drive, or triple layer cell, uh, which is normally the best compromise between you know, storage density and write performance, or write and read performance, and they're using a data branded NAND flash here. Now, like I said, it does have SLC caching, single level cell caching, which they claim is around about 15% of the drive's total capacity, although it can vary depending on how full the drive is. In my testing with a near empty drive, the, ca the caching amount was more like 10% or around 100 gigs from my one terabyte model instead of the claimed, I suppose, 150, but I didn't test it across the entire capacity of the drive, if that makes sense. It also has DDR4 for caching, as well as using an SM2267 controller, which is Silicon Motion's effectively budget-oriented controller, which can offer up to 3.9 gigabytes per second in reads and 3.5 gigabytes per second in writes, although this drive didn't quite reach that. So the drive itself comes with a thin metal heat spreader glued on to the sort of top side, the, the controller side, which is the side you normally want cooling anyway, and that actually did an okay job at keeping the drive under the 75 degrees Celsius of smart thermal throttling temperature, uh, and as long as you have a reasonable amount of airflow, you should be fine with that. Now it is slim enough that you probably would be able to put this in a normal slot on a motherboard with a heatsink on top, although if you did want to remove it, like I said, it is glued down, so it's a bit of a pain to get off and you might damage some things. Now it is a double-sided drive, and on this one terabit model, there are two NAND flash chips on the reverse of the, the back side with a you know, paper sticker on top, uh, but they don't get overly hot, and generally NAND flash doesn't need to be cooled anyway, so that's all good. Otherwise, it is a standard drive. It's a 2280 in size, so fits in pretty much any laptop or uh, you know standard motherboard you want. Although you will want to make sure that you're using a PCIe Gen 4 compatible board, which at the time of filming is only an AMD B550 or X570 board with a Ryzen 3000 or 5000 CPU. And that's pretty much it. Of course, that will change over time, but if you want to get the most out of the drive, you need to be using one of those boards and CPUs. So that's the drive, but what about its performance? Well, in the synthetic tests, in a sort of best case scenario, think one megabyte blocks at a Q-depth of four, it can reach around about three gigabytes per second in reads and about 3.2 gigabytes per second in writes. Although, especially on the write side of things, that is a fair bit off what the maximum quoted that the controller can do. It is, however, pretty much on point for what a data say this drive can do, so I guess that's down to their configuration of how they set up the drive and the NAND flash that they're using. And in a more pessimistic test like ASSSD, in sequential reads, it reckons more like 3.4 gigabytes per second and 2.95 gigabytes per second in writes, aka pretty much a Gen 3 drive. Now, in the, the sort of uh, random tests and the more difficult to transfer, I have found in pretty much all of my Gen 4 SSD testing that they really aren't much, if any, better than a good quality Gen 3 drive for the moment, as most of the controllers that we've seen, especially the, the, the Fizen one, is pretty much just the Gen 3 version, but with its band, uh, bandwidth cap increased effectively, so you can get higher top end speeds, but down at the low end, you don't really see much difference, and that's the same here. In my file transfer stress test, where I'm duplicating a set of files around about 85, 90 gigabytes uh, on the drive itself, so you, you're stressing the reads and writes simultaneously, that uh, was seeing about, well, actually a little bit over one gigabyte per second, which is a pretty good result for, for this test. Having it sit, especially from the, the full first 80, 85 gigabytes of copy, it was sitting above one gigabyte per second for the majority of the test, pretty much exactly how you would expect it to, and so 
that's pretty decent. The thing is though, if you were to copy more than the SLC cache amount, which like I said is about 100 gigabytes, the performance drops off a cliff. It varied anywhere between 200 megabytes per second and about 800 megabytes per second, averaging somewhere in the middle to three or 400. But that's not fantastic considering that, like I said, in full fat performance, it's over one gigabyte per second. And it gets even worse because after I copied around about three, uh, 450 gigabytes of data, the last 100 to 150 was incredibly slow and it was decreasing as it went on, it got to the point where towards the last, say, 50 gigs, it was copying at 100 to 200 megabytes per second with bursts up to about three, but not much more than that. And that's not great. Now, in reality, most users won't ever write more than, well, 50 or 100 gigs at a time uh, at full NVMe speeds. Even things like installing games, you don't do that. You're limited by your internet and then your CPU's decoding ability and extraction ability. And so generally speaking, you won't run into that issue. But just know that if you do, this is a pretty slow drive after it gets you know out of cache space. Although you will be happy to know that even if you do hammer it and write basically half the capacity of the drive to it all at once, at least in my testing with it above the graphics card with a little bit of airflow over it, it didn't peak at more than 65 degrees Celsius, which is well below the 75 degrees Celsius that it takes to start thermal throttling drives. Uh, like I said, that was above the GPU, and so if you're having yours under your graphics card, you might have a bit more heat under there and a bit more uh, difficulty, but I don't expect it to thermal throttle too readily. But all of that doesn't really explain or answer the question of why this thing actually exists, right? Like, it's a PCI Gen 4 drive, which means you can only use it in a small subset of motherboards to get the full performance out of it, and yet it's barely faster than a good Gen 3 one, and costs ever so slightly more than the early sets of Gen 4 drives like the Sabret one that perform much better. I would much rather spend five pounds less on this and get four or five gigabytes per second rather than spending, well, five pounds more and getting what is essentially just a really good Gen 3 drive instead, right? Like, it doesn't really make much sense to me, nor does the SM2267 controller, because it's such a small gap in terms of how much faster that controller is over a good Gen 3 one, so yeah, I'm just, I'm left feeling confused. If you can find this drive uh, on sale for more like 150 instead of the 175 they're asking for it, this is still a great buy. It's a good drive, it performs well, and while the SLC cache is a little on the small side, it still performs well, and for most people, that doesn't really matter. But at MSRP, yeah, I think I'd probably give this one a pass. Now with that said, those are my thoughts, but I would love to hear yours in the comments down below. Is this a drive you'd pick up yourself? Can you think of a use case why having this very, very, ever so slightly technically Gen 4 drive exists rather than going for a, a more full fat one or the true full fat ones like the Samsung 980 and the new Sabrent uh, Gen 4 drive that's gonna have more like seven or eight gigabytes per second instead? I would love to hear your thoughts in those comments down below. Now with that said, if you do want to check out the S50 Lite and maybe see pricing when and where you watch this, because it can and does vary, I'm going to leave a link to it in the description down below. Uh, that will be an Amazon affiliate link that will take you to a local Amazon store where you can see all that good stuff. And I'll leave a link to the Sabrent one down there too. Otherwise, that is pretty much it. There are plenty of other links in the description you can check out, from merch or hoodies or t-shirts like this one. You can get sponsor-free videos and access to our Money Men Discord chat via Patreon. And there's a load of other affiliate links if you're buying from places like Overclocks UK, feel free to do that, and a load of other stuff too. Otherwise, feel free to check out some more videos up there. I'll leave the review of the Sabrent one since I've been talking about it so much, and there's plenty of other to check out. Of course, make sure you hit that subscribe button, and we'll see you all in the next video.